woman. Because and, and what appeals to me, I guess, and maybe what doesn't appeal to others, is that the book of James is not concerned with being politically correct. It's not. Right? It's not, it's not a concern. It's not touchy-feely. It, it's just straightforward. Right? It shows no partiality that James is not concerned with offending people either. Right? He, he, does, he doesn't really uh, uh, care whether you like what he's saying or not. He's basically saying if the shoe fits, wear it. Right? If it doesn't apply to you, then don't worry about it. If it does, you need to repent. You need to make some change in your life. And, and so just deal with the text that James is not concerned with growing a large church at the expense of compromising the word of God, and neither will will be. We won't do that either. And so, you know, the, the, the Lord's will will be done. See, James holds all believers to a very high standard of living, but it's a standard that's attainable because the Holy Spirit of God lives in us. That's what he desires for us to be. He's not saying, make it happen, or, or you need to do, to do better, that the Spirit of God himself dwells within us to, to empower us to become the type of people that he would have us to be. And so uh, to, uh, James uh, made it absolutely, it made no sense to be forgiven of all sin, to be given a new heart, to be given uh, Christ's righteousness, to have the very Spirit of God dwelling inside you, and yet continue living your life in the same manner as though you did before you ever got saved. It just made no sense to him. It is absurd to proclaim faith in God and then go on living your life as though he does not even exist. Which brings us to our title tonight, Ignoring God. To ignore God and make no sense. That, that's what's known as practical atheism. You ever heard that term before? Practical atheism. It, it's where we, we claim to believe in God, but we live our lives as though there is no God. And that's what many of us do, whether we know it or not. A, a, a recent uh, survey uh, showed that only 17% of professing Christians feel that the local church is necessary for spiritual growth and one in three believe God expects them to live holy lives. That kind of bears out the numbers, right? You look around this room, right? It kind of bears that out. Like, church is optional. You know, it's no big deal. You can come or go or be here or not be here. It really doesn't matter. And so we just kind of, you know, we just kind of do what we want to do. And so it, the numbers bear it out. Uh, Pastor Perry Noble made this statement about practical atheism. He says that we believe in Jesus enough to get us out of hell, but not actually enough to change the way we live. Right? We see that. We see that, that, that played out over and over, week after week, that we will gladly take our get-out-of-hell-free card but reject any further interruptions or involvement uh, for God or by God in our lives unless we feel we need Him uh, for something else later. Right? Basically, we just want to, we'll, we'll take your salvation. We'll take your grace. We, you know, thank you very much for that. But basically, just go away. Go away, don't bother me, don't, inter- don't, don't be involved in my life, don't, don't check in. It, look, don't call me, I'll call you. And that's how we treat God. It doesn't work that way. We, we ignore God when we live our lives that way. We need to just have this, this big old God button somewhere that we can push when we need something from Him. You see, this attitude reveals that we truly have no love for God at all. That we only love what God can give us or do for us. Kind of like He's a genie. And that's just not right. That's not a biblical relation. That's not what the Word of God teaches us. See, when we profess faith in Jesus, we're surrendering every area of our lives to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That's what we do. That's what we do when we repent of our sins and place our faith in Jesus. That what go, that's what goes with it. It's like signing over the title of a home or a car once you sell it. It no longer belongs to you, right? It's the same way with our bodies, our minds, our souls. When we give ourselves over to the Lord, that's what happens, that we become His possessions. That we're to be used for, for him, for his purposes, and for his glory, and for his honor. And you say, well, Brother Mike, well, what about, what about my free will? What, what, what about my free will? Doesn't that viol- violate my free will? And, and, and let me just tell you this. I've told you all this before, I believe. I don't, I don't necessarily think that we have a free will per se. I, I really don't think we have a freed will. Add a D on there, a freed will. And I say that because, you know, our will has been set free from sin to choose righteousness, that we've been set free, that before faith in Christ we were slaves to sin, that all we could, were capable of was choosing to sin, that we were dead in our sins and our trespasses, but now we have been freed, that we have been set free from that bondage to sin, that we have now been given the freedom to choose to be obedient to God or to be disobedient. So I think that makes more sense than just saying I have a free will. You have a freed will. 
your will before was in bondage to sin. You were a slave to sin. Now you're a, a slave to righteousness if you were in Christ Jesus. That we struggle with our old nature every minute of every day, right? I know you do, and so do I. But that's not a cop-out for us. See, that ongoing struggle with the, the old nature is what James is talking about here tonight. And just to remind you of our, our context, apparently, uh, even in the infancy of the church, there were some professing Christians that were uh, fleshly, or, or they were, were carnal, or, or living uh, as though God did not exist. And even in the midst of their persecution, that many of them, the dispersed believers lost everything that they had, right? We talked about that. They, they had to, to leave in a hurry, or, or things were taken away, or they lost their families, or lost their businesses, or lost their means of income. But even in the midst of all that, that time of great loss, that they learned that God was sufficient, that God was enough, even in the midst of all of those things, that he was trustworthy to provide for their every need. And likely some of them had recovered. They had recovered quite well, and things had gotten better for them. And, and they had once again began to flourish in their business dealings, and they were no longer dependent on God anymore. You yeah, know what I'm talking about? That, that you know that you go through those seasons where you kind of hit rock bottom, and life gets hard, and and marriage is in trouble, or your career is in trouble, or health is, is, is failing you, and man, you pray, don't you? When things get hard, you, I mean, you have no choice but to pray. You turn to God, and you plead with God, and, you, and you're more faithful to church, and you're here, and, and you're, you're soaking in the Word of God, and man, you are really just pleading with God to help me. But when everything gets better, right, whenever the sickness, go, sickness goes away, whenever the marriage is reconciled, whenever the career gets back on track, and whenever your bank account is full, sometimes we fade. We, depend, we start to drift away at that point, and that's what he's talking about here. We become self-reliant. We, become to, uh, we, we think that we're okay now, and we don't have a need for God anymore. And so how is it that, that we, we do these things, that, that we become that way, just like these, these early Christians were? So how often do you find yourself ignoring God? I mean, if you're honest tonight, but just you and God, how often do you ignore God? You see, it happens when we choose to live our lives on our own terms, when we, we fill up our schedules with our own plans and the things that we want to do, whenever we want to just align uh, 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 ourselves or fill our, our days with our priorities. We never give a, a God a thought in seeking out what He would have for the will of our lives or the lives of our children. Right? We want to plan everything out. We have, we have everything laid out. This is what I want to do. This is where I'm going to live. This is where I'm going to work. This is where my kids are going to go to school. This is where they're going to go to college. This is the girl I want them to marry. This is the boy I want them to marry. And I have a piece of land I've already set aside, and they're going to build their house right here next to me. Right? We have it all laid out. And where is God in the midst of all those things? Look, maybe God did lead you to want this, this girl to be your son's wife. Or maybe God did lead you to have a desire for, for your child to live here. Or whatever the case is. I don't know. Most of the time, I'm speaking from my own heart. I make lots of plans without ever seeking God's face. Lots of plans. And I've made lots of mistakes, I'm sure, along the way. And if you're honest, so have you. You've done the very same things. That, that we have our plans and then we expect God to bless it. Right? You know, it's like doing a construction job. I've, I've, taken, I've done a takeoff. I've got my material list. I've got my prints, and now I'm going to turn them into the, the job supervisor for, for his approval. Here they are. Sign off on them. Get your stamp. doesn't work that way. That's totally ignoring God when we live that way. We do whatever we want to do. That's what the problem is here. You know, how many of you have honestly prayed and sought God's will for, you know, where you should live or uh, where you should work or where you should go to college, if at all, or, or what to do with your free time or, or what you uh, do with your, your finances or who you should marry or what church you should join or, or how you should serve in that church or when you should speak and when you should remain quiet. All these things. There are no small things. We should be seeking God on everything. All things matter to Him. I think about how many vocational missionaries never reach the mission field because uh, mom and dad have already decided the children the future plans. We've already decided what they're going to do, so they're not going to the mission field. They're going to college. How many church plants never happen because existing churches are unwilling to send out their best and their brightest to start a new work? We want to keep them right here. Man, that dude, that's the best Sunday school teacher I got. Man, he, he, he does everything around here. Why in the world would I send him out to start a new work? I want him here. I need him to, to, to stay here. We're, we're weaker without him. Look, if God is calling you to send somebody out, you need to send them out. 
That's what the church in Antioch did. We talked about that in discipleship tonight. The best and the brightest, the best too. Give me Barnabas and, 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 pa- and Paul. Send them out. We were like, what? Let's keep praying. I think, I think we got the lines crossed. Those two are pretty sharp. I got some other people I don't mind getting rid of. I, I got a bunch of them. I got a, a long list of folks I'll ship off, but I want to keep them. So how many times do we do that? How many marriages struggle needlessly simply because God's design for marriage is being ignored? Or how many churches struggle for decades simply because they've ignored God's will to make the necessary changes to be effective in, cha- in a changing culture around them? Y'all get what I'm saying? We ignore God. We have our own plans. You see, I, I met with a pastor search committee in North Baton Rouge uh, of a once thriving uh, church that was located in a community that was in the midst of a, a, a drastic ethnic shift, right? And, and, and the, commu- the community was changing. The demographics were changing. And, and, and you know, they went from being a predominantly white community to a predominantly minority community. And the church was dying. It was on the decline big time. And the majority of the members that remained there were senior adult, you know, white men and women. And they were still wanting to keep on operating just like they always had before. Everything that they had done in the past, they want to keep on doing it, don't want to change anything. And you know, even though the church was nearly to the point of disbanding, they still was not willing to change and do anything different. They were willing to let the church close its doors rather than submitting to God's will and take on a different approach to ministry in a changing community. Right? Needless to say, I prayed, and they prayed, and here I am today. Right? They weren't willing to do those things. They weren't willing to listen to God. They weren't willing to, to, to submit themselves to God's will. They were real, willing to close the doors and keep on doing things their way because they liked it that way. They had their plans, and they were not willing to let God intervene or to change those things. And tonight, James is going to give us four examples of how we ignore God on a regular basis. When we live self-sufficiently, when we live presumptuously, when we live arrogantly, and when we live defiantly. And of course, none of these are hard to understand that that James is, as I've already said, he's straightforward, but they will cause us to examine our lives if we're willing to let the Holy Spirit do what he does. Or we can be hard-hearted and we can ignore everything that's said here tonight. You know, let, let the Holy Spirit teach us to convict us of our sin and then correct us. So go ahead and grab your copy of the scriptures and stand as we honor the reading of God's word together. James chapter 4, verses 13 to 17. It says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance, uh, all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Father, we come to you tonight asking you to forgive us where we have ignored you. Lord, it's not really even a question of whether or not we have or not. It's a matter of how often we do it. So, God, we ask that you would forgive us in this, Lord, and that we would be a a, a more committed, a a, a better, a more faithful church to you, that we would seek your face in all things. Lord, that we would not uh, make up our own plans and have our own things to do and then ask you to to, to approve what we want to do. God, help us to learn from this passage tonight. Correct us, Lord. Teach us that we would walk in your ways. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You see, God is not against us making plans, right? That's not what this passage is saying. You could, you could read this and just glance over it and say, well, it seems like he has a problem with, with, people, with us making plans. God's not against us making plans for the future. God is against his people making plans without seeking his will for those plans. That's what the problem is. That's what the whole hangup is here, that we're ignoring God's will. Uh, Pastor Johnny Hunt said, said it like this. He said, the fact is that we're wise to plan ahead and plan well. However, we must always allow space in our plans with God in mind. At any juncture, God might step in and interrupt or even alter the plans. He could even cancel them altogether. I'm sure y'all know exactly what that's about. Y'all have all experienced th- this to some extent. That James is once again here modeling the same mindset that his big brother Jesus did as he challenged those that would follow him in his time of earthly ministry. Luke 
12, 16 to 21, says something similar. It says, Then he spoke to a parable of them, saying, The ground of a certain a rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and, and build greater and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you may uh, have many goods, look, goods laid up for many years. Take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So, he, so is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You see, God called this kind of person a fool. And we too are fools when we choose to ignore God. That's what he's saying here. That we too are foolish when we ignore God. I I don't know about you, but I want to hear good and well done, faithful servant, when I stand before the Lord. When I come into his presence, that's what I want to hear. I don't want to hear him say, here's another one of those fools that took my grace and forgiveness but ignored my will for their lives. I don't want him to say that to me. I don't want to be known as a fool for God. Not in that way. And so the first way that James would tell us Tonight, that we can ignore God is by living self-sufficiently. Verse 13, it says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there, buy and sell and, and make a profit. You see, here in America, we, we, we have this, this, this uh, American ingenuity, this, this pride in ourselves to be self-sufficient. It's almost like we're born with it, right? That we have, it's like in our DNA that we're, we're supposed to be uh, strong and to be able to get things done all by ourselves and to, to not have to ask anyone for help or for anything. And, and you know, to be clear, that's not a bad thing. It, it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad quality to have. To, in fact, it's a strong quality to have. But for some of us, we begin to think too highly of ourselves. We begin to think too highly of ourselves that we don't need anyone's help or input, even God's. Right? We got this. Right, God, you know, I know you got, you got all these people over there in Africa that need clean water and are starving. You take care of that, and I'll take care of this. Right, I can take care of my own household and the things around here. You know, Occupy 2 is pretty good. We, 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 I got this. You take care of that, and I'll take care of this. Wrong. Wrong. Absolutely wrong. That we become prideful and self-sufficient. We begin to think too highly of ourselves and, you know, that, that we have this, 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 uh, this uh, you know, pridefulness in us and this uh, corrupt nature that we still deal with, that, that we're prideful. And this pridefulness in us leads us to, to being self-sufficient. And, of course, pride will blind us to our need for help, even from God. And pride will ultimately cause us to take credit for what God has enabled us to accomplish. Right? It does. It's like, look what I did. Look what I did. Look at my home. Look at my career. Look at my family. Look at my church. Look at all these things I've done. Ain't, ain't I great? Don't, don't you wish you was as, as smart as me and as strong as me? Don't you wish you could do what I did? All these I, 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 me, me, me. That's what self-sufficiency does. You see that there was this, this, this same type of thing going on that uh, back in the, the Old Testament, if you're familiar with the story of of Nebuchadnezzar. He, he was a, the Babylonian king that God raised up and ruled the world, right? Dominant, right? He raised them up to allow them to be used for judgment against Israel. And, and he had done all these great things uh, through that king. And that, that king developed a very serious eye problem, right? He likes to say I a lot. And like, look at what I've done. And his pride got the best of him one day. And, and God dealt him in a, in a very harsh manner to, to teach him that he was not as strong and self-sufficient as he thought. In Daniel chapter 4, it says this. Daniel chapter 4, verses 30 to 33, it says, The king spoke, saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? And while the word was still in, his, in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven, King Nebuchadnezzar, To you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you, and they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen, and seven times shall pass over you until you know the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives to whomever he chooses. That very hour the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with dew of heaven till his hair and, uh, and it had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. You see, this, this individual that, that James is talking about 
are, are describing here is, is someone who's already made a plan for how he or she would go and be successful in their business venture, right? They, they, to make a profit. That's what he's talking about here. He they, they said, you know, I've got it all figured out. I've formulated a plan. I've run the numbers. I've, I've double and triple, triple checked all the figures, and I'm ready to make it happen. Right? That's what's going on here. That's what's what, what happening here in this passage that James is talking about. They decide on their own when they would leave. They decide on their own where they would go. They decide on their own how long they would stay. All these things totally devoid of God's input. Never, never sought, sought prayer, never sought any input from Him at all. This is what they decided to do. And this is exactly what most people do. And that's James' point, that Christians aren't supposed to operate like most people. We are God's people. We're supposed to be different. Our lives are supposed to be different and shaped differently. That we're depend on God for everything. And everything means everything. All things. Nothing is too small. That Jesus made it clear that apart from Him we could do nothing, right? John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do what? Nothing. Jack squat. Right? That's another translation. Jack squat. You can't do anything. So how do we overcome being self-sufficient? How can we fix this problem? We pray about everything. You mean everything? Everything. We pray about everything. Nothing is too small for us to pray about. We seek God's wisdom from His Word. We have to be people of the book. Not just own one, read it, study it, know it, learn it. And if you say, well, I don't like to read or I, you know, I'm not a good reader, Get it, get, it, get it on audio. Get you a CD. Get you a cassette. Don't let that be an excuse to not be in God's Word. We have the technology nowadays. We're in the 21st century. We can make it happen. If you can't do it, come find me. I'll help you out. I will be glad to help you get a, a means to be able to be exposed to God's Word. And then we wait. As we pray and seek God's face, we wait and we trust in faith that God will provide according to His will. And we don't blink until He does. We wait. So are you trusting God to lead you and provide for you in His ways and in His will and in His timing? Or are you just doing what you feel is right for you? You know, that's a question you have to you know, really, really be honest with yourself. Are you doing what He wants you to do? Or are you doing just what you feel is right for you? The second way James would tell us that we ignore God is by living presumptuously. Presumptuously. That's some big words. Y'all write them down and save them for when you're playing, playing uh, Scrabble. Get you some points. Verse 14 says, Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. You see, we're, we're a culture that is, uh, is borderline obsessed with knowing the future. Right? We, we, we are. We, wanna, we always want to know what's next, what's coming. We want to uh, always know. See, a, a recent uh, Pew Research report showed that one uh, out of every seven people have consulted a psychic or a fortune teller at some point in their lives. All right? That's a, that's a pretty high number. But listen, it gets worse. Sadly, one out of every eight professing Christians have also done the same thing. All right? Christians are doing this. That 25% of Americans believe in astrology. All right? Believe in astrology. That sadly, 24% of professing Christians believe in astrology as well. You know what astrology is? It's looking at the stars. It's reading the stars, and that's how you tell the future is how the stars are, the, the stars are aligning a certain way, and this is going to happen. And, oh, look, look how it's aligned. Now I know who to marry. Look how the stars are aligned. It's perfect. I'm supposed to marry such and such. Nonsense. Nonsense. It's, it's, it's fantasy. See, nobody knows what the future holds. Nobody. Nobody knows. Nobody knows but God. He's the only one who knows what the future holds. See, that's what we mean when we say that, that, that God is sovereign, that, that, that God is in complete control of, of, of over all things, of all times, past, present, and future. And when we, when we make presumptuous statements regarding our futures, we're ignoring God's sovereignty over our lives. We make statements, declarative statements, and I know sometimes we can confuse those statements as being, I'm, I'm, sta- I'm saying this in faith. I'm speaking this truth into existence. I, I'm believing that God will do this. Right? That's different. That's different. That, that, that is de- declaring that God has laid this on my heart and God has said that we will do such and such. That's different. I'm talking about times where we just, just make these statements that I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. Like this person here, I'm going to go to such and such a city and make this much money and stay this long. That's presuming upon God. That's being presumptuous. You don't know how long you're going to be. You don't know where you're going to go. You don't know how long your life is going to last. 
See, that we, we think that we're in control of our future, and that's just funny. I mean, that's just really funny. See, that, 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 the, 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 this control that we think we have, it's an illusion. It's, a, it's, a, it's an illusion. We aren't in control of anything. You know, yes, that we're to be good stewards of our health, and, but we must know that God has already de- de- determined our days. That James says that our lives are like a vapor, that we come and go. You know that. You have to know that, that your life is short. In light of eternity, all of our lives are extremely brief. You know, so it seems like I was, you know, just the other day, I was thinking about this. As you know, you have a, a son that's about to graduate, and he's our baby. You know, Caleb's about to be out of the house. And it just seems like just the other day, maybe because, you know, Bill's working with William with coaches pitch. They're just starting out. And it seems like just the other day that me and Caleb were out there getting ready for that. You know, just getting ready to, to throw the ball around a little bit. And now he's graduating high school. He's graduating high school in two months. Where did the time go? Right? Life is fast. It moves so quickly. You know, it, it goes so fast that, that Leslie and I will be married 27 years come November. Can you believe that? I know we don't look that old, right? We don't, we don't look old enough to be married 27 years. Y'all getting married when y'all was like, when y'all was like seven? One of them arranged marriages? No, it's, it's, it's 27 years. Or, 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 or guess what? Some of y'all was going to be shocked by this. I'll be the pastor here three years come July. And some of y'all was like, man, it's been like 15. You sure? You sure it's only been three years? Yeah, yes, let's recount those things. Time flies by, and it seems to go even faster the older you get. Amen? There's lots of amens out there for that. You know, it just seems to be going by faster. It's like when you turn over an hourglass, it seems like when you first turn the hourglass over, like the sand's not even moving, right? You look at it, it's like, man, this thing ain't going nowhere. But once, you know, the majority of that sand gets out of that thing, man, that sand's flying to the hourglass. That thing is emptying out quick, and it's just our lives are the same way. Everything moves by so quickly that time escapes us. So that James is warning us to repent of presuming on tomorrow, that we're not promised a tomorrow, that we are not promised, promised another breath, to be exact, that God and His sovereignty decides those things, that we become fools like the presumptuous farmer of Luke 12 when we ignore God's sovereignty over our lives. So we need to be careful in this area. And the third way that James would tell us that we ignore God is by living arrogantly. Verses 15 and 16. He says, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we, will, uh, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. And some of y'all know, and some of y'all may not know, that nearly every Sunday morning, a group of men meet to pray before Sunday school. And we meet for many things, and we have many things that we pray about. But the main gist of every one of those prayers is that the, the Lord's will be done. The Lord's will be done in the Sunday school hour. The Lord's will, will be done in the, in the worship service. The Lord's will be done in the discipleship training. The Lord's will be done in the evening service. The, all those things we gather for that sole purpose, to pray for the Lord's will to be done. And that should, it should be what with all of our prayer is for every day. That the, the Lord, you know, basically, what is your will for my life in this day? In this day. You know, what, what would you have me do in this day? How would you want to use me in this day? That we have a choice to make each and every day as the people of God. We will, we will uh, have to die to self again today and say that the Lord's will be done in this day. Or we'll live in arrogant defiance of the Lord's will and just do what we want. All right, that's the choice. Either I'll wake up in the morning and say, all right, Lord, what do you want me to do? What, what, what would you have me do in this day? Or I'm just going to do what I want. I'm taking a day off. All right, God, I'm, I'm, I've been used by you these last few days. I'm kind of tired, and, and today I'm just going to do what I want to do. So I'm taking a day off. Or I'm going to take a week off. I'm going to take a month off. Or I'm going to take a year off. It doesn't work that way. That, that, that we have given ourselves to him, that he is our Lord. We submit ourselves to him. And so it, it really comes down to lordship. And lots of people don't like to talk about that. They don't, they don't even like that term, lordship. They're, you know, some people believe or don't believe in lordship salvation. It's like, how in the world could somebody be saved and Jesus not be their Lord, right? That they're sovereign, they're, they're king, that you must do as he says. See, either Jesus is Lord of your life, you know, or, or, or you are. That's your two choices. Either, either he rules or you do. And so we need to be, if we're going to be the people of God, he is our Lord. We submit ourselves to his will. And so I, I blame this mainly on pastors that preach an easy believism or, or, you know, just so they can get their baptism numbers up, 
right? That we just want to get our numbers up, and so we want to get a bunch of people through here and just, just, just tell them just this, this simple little, uh, you know, just, just do this and do that, and we'll baptize you, and we'll give you a T-shirt, and we'll send you on your way. See, that's, God, there's more to it than that. Discipleship and teaching and commitment, all these things are part of being a, a follower of Christ. That they preach that Jesus just wants to save you from hell so you can go on living a free and happy life and then go to heaven when you die. Listen to me, that's all true. That's all true, but it's incomplete. That, that we are free from the bondage of sin, but we are certainly not free from the authority and rule of Jesus over our lives. You see, when we profess faith in Jesus, we put our yes on the table. I've, I've heard it said before, like giving a, a, God a blank check. That's what we do, a blank check mentality. You know, you, you, you just lay it out there, whatever you want to do. Put, you, you fill in the numbers, whatever you want from me, God. That's what we're saying. We say yes to His grace. And, and mercy and his forgiveness we say yes to eternal life we say yes to discipleship and growing in wisdom and knowledge of god and his word we say yes to sharing the gospel with the lost we say yes to living in obedience uh, to god and his word we say yes to being used by god in whatever way he chooses to use us and yes to going wherever god wants us to go and yes to accepting whatever the lord's will is for our lives with an emphasis on whatever whatever Whatever, God, whatever you want to do with me, wherever you want to send me, I'll go. And then when we boast of our plans that we have made for our lives without seeking God's will, James calls that arrogant, and he calls it evil. It's evil. It's back to that same thing, that word he keeps using. It's satanic. It's demonic. That even if our plans are for good things, they are still evil because they are not aligned with God's will for our lives. See, these business people that James was addressing were not crooks. Right? They weren't playing to rip people off. They were simply uh, 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 doing what they had chosen to do on their own will uh, without ever seeking God's will first. Right? They're not crooks. It's, you know, what's wrong with what they're doing? What's wrong is they didn't seek God's will. That's, what, that's what's wrong here. There's nothing wrong. They, they weren't shady. They weren't ripping people off. They didn't have a Ponzi scheme going on. They weren't going to take advantage of people. What they did that was wrong was they didn't seek God's will. They ignored God. That's why it was wrong. That's why it was evil, and why, that's why it's the same way for us. How quickly we forget that God is the potter and we are the clay, right? That, that he is the potter and we are the clay. The potter gets to decide what the clay will be used for. Romans t- uh, 9, uh, 20 says, But indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, Why have you made me like this? Or we would say, Why have you asked me to do this? Why are you asking me to go to this place? Why are you asking me to give this up? Why are you asking, why? Why, why, why? As a parent, don't you love when your kids ask you why? Not why because they want to know. They're asking you why in defiance. And that's really what we do when we ask God why. We're not asking why per se. We want to know, you know, it's being uh, uh, obstinate or being defiant towards God. It's being arrogant is what James would say. And the fourth and, and final way that James would tell us tonight that we ignore God is by living defiantly. Living defiantly. Verse 17 says, Therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. You see, we ignore God when we choose to live in in defiance of what he has commanded us to do and not to do. That we all know that that doing what God has told us not to do is sin, right? We know that. We understand that part of it, that that act of sin, that those are known as sins of commission, right? We understand that. We, We get that, I think. I think we get that part, but, but the part we have trouble with is that, that, we, are, that we are guilty of sinning because we de, de, uh, uh, you know, defied what God has told us not to do. You know, an example, when he tells us to not gossip or not to slander or, or do not lie, do not steal, do not covet, do not commit adultery, do not commit fornication, do not be drunk, uh, or do not be a glut. We understand that. We understand what it means to, to not do what God has told us to do. We understand those are sins of commission. But James is closing chapter 4 with a sharp warning uh, 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 to a, a, a manner of sin that most of us never give any thought to. Sins of omission. Sins of omission. And, and what a sin of omission is, is we sin when we do not do what God has told us to do. Right? What he's told us, not, he not what he told us not to do. We understand that. He, he, said not, he says, do not do these things. We get that. But when he tells us to do things and we don't do it, we don't realize that's sin. We don't think it's sin. We, we just totally ignore that we understand this concept in everyday life, right? When, when you tell your children to clean their rooms and they do not do it, they're guilty of not doing what you told them to do. 
right? That they're, they're guilty of sins of omission. And you told them to clean their room and they didn't do it. We understand that, right? We, we, we get that. And when, you, when your boss tells you to be in the office for 8 a.m., but you routinely show up at 8.15, you're guilty of not doing what your boss said. Right? That's, that's guilty of, of a sin of omission. You're not doing what he told you to do. But when we fail to do the good that we know to do, what God's word has made clear, we are guilty of sin against God, and our sin has a consequence, both immediate and eternity. See, we do not lose our salvation, but there will still be some sense of loss of what eternal glory could have been for us in the afterlife, in eternity. It's why we will stand in judgment, and that each one of us will give an account of our lives, both what we did and what we did not do. Do you ever think about that? It's not like we're not going to be able to come before the Lord and, and guess what? I didn't do this. I didn't do that. I didn't do none of those things. I didn't smoke. I didn't drink. I didn't cuss. I didn't watch R-rated movies. And, and, and God said, that's great. That's wonderful. I'm, I'm so, that's, that's great. But what about this? You didn't do these things. I told you to do these things. You didn't do these. What about those? What are you going to say to that? How will you answer that question? You want to say, well, I didn't do this. And he'll say, well, what about this? I told you to do these. You, you left these undone. That's sin as well. That, that's sinful as well to not do what he says. And, and I would say that, that for us, the, the top two sins of omission that most Christians commit on a regular basis is that we do not share the gospel. We do not share the gospel. When we don't share the gospel, that's sinful. We know that. The Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19 to 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. This is a command. This is a command. This is what he's telling us that this is not a recommendation, and it does not end with a question mark. When we do not share the gospel, we're sinning. It's a sin of omission. We're not doing what God is telling us to do. And I would say that also the, the, the second way, the, the second common way that we uh, commit the sin of omission is that we do not commit to the local church. We do not commit to the local church. Hebrews 10, 24 to 25. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much uh, the more as you see the day approaching. Again, this is a command. This is not a recommendation. See, this does not end with a question mark. Listen to me. God is just as serious about our sins of omission as he is about our sins of commission. He doesn't differentiate. You know, we want to pat ourselves on the back because we don't do all these things. We're not like all them other people, but we, but we fail on a regular basis to do what he has told us to do. We're still sinners. That some of us think that we're nailing being a Christian because we, uh, like I said, don't smoke or we don't cuss or we don't drink beer. And that's great and that's wonderful. But what are you doing with what God has told you to do? That so many of us aren't doing anything that he has told us to do. Too many of us are living our lives as though God does not even exist. That we have become practical atheists. Practical atheists is going through the motions that we are all guilty of ignoring God. So tonight as we close our, our time together, that, that, that some of you ignore God because you do not belong to him. Right? And that makes sense. Right? You know, you say, well, you know, sure, I don't, I don't listen to God or do what God says because, you know, I don't believe in God. And that's to be expected. You know, that, that, that individual has no relationship with God through Christ. But listen, you can tonight. You can tonight. That can be rectified tonight that you can have a relationship with God and you can, and you can belong to God tonight. That he is calling you to be saved. It's why you're here tonight. You're not just here tonight because it's Sunday night and it's 6 o'clock and you're supposed to be here. You're here because God wants you here. You have a a divine appointment to be saved here tonight. Don't ignore his calling. Don't ignore his grace. And certainly do not ignore his lordship over your life. That he is calling you to be saved. And for my brothers and sisters in Christ here tonight, I will close with some questions for you to ponder in your own heart, in your own mind. Is God calling you to do something that you have been putting off? Right? Is God calling you to do something that you've been putting off for some time now? Is God calling you to give up something? Is there something, that, that, that a sin in your life that, that you are struggling with or hiding from everybody else that He's calling you to give up, to put away? Is God calling you to go somewhere and you keep on resisting? I've told you all before, 
You know, I, I, one day I want to see people leave here because God's calling them to, to a new work somewhere else. I'm tired of people leaving here because they get their feelings hurt or because we don't play the right music or, or we don't do what they want to do or whatever little petty thing comes up. I want you to go. I want you to go. I want God to use you in, in other places to start new works. Church plant. Annie Armstrong often we're talking about it all this month, the next three weeks, that God is calling some people to a new work. Is God calling you somewhere and you keep on resisting? Let tonight be the night that you stop ignoring God. That you stop ignoring God tonight. Let tonight be the night that that we repent of living self-sufficiently and presumptuously and arrogantly and defiantly. It's time to truly submit uh, to the Lord's will for our lives. Let's let's get busy doing what He says to do. right? Let's, Let's do what He tells us to do in His Word and through our prayers. Our lives are like a vapor that we only have a limited amount of time and then we aren't promised a tomorrow. Let's stop ignoring God and do what He tells us to do and go where He tells us to go. Amen? All right. Let's pray and we'll have a time of response as the Lord leads. Father, we thank You so much for Your Word. We thank You for Your grace, God. And Lord, I, I know this was not an easy message to hear, but Lord, it's, it's so true. God, when we live our lives apart from you, when we make decisions apart from you, when we uh, live our lives as though you do not exist, we li- we're no different than an atheist. So, Father, I-, I pray that we would be intentional about seeking your face in all things. Lord, that we would not move until you say to move. God, that we would not make a, a plan, a, a single plan of a-, of a day without seeking your face first. God, I pray for those here tonight that are that are are struggling with decisions, Father, that you've been burdening their hearts for, for a, a period of time, Lord, that, you've, that you have been convicting them of a, of a sin that they haven't been able to, to let go of. God, I pray that tonight that stronghold would, would come down. Father, I, I pray for those that you've been dealing with for quite some time, that you've been calling them to a new work or to, to, to serve in a new capacity or, or, or even in the workplace, God, that, that they have just been unwilling to, to move. And to do what you've called them to do. God, I pray that you would give them the courage to do that tonight. Father, for those here tonight that don't yet know you, Lord, that are sons of disobedience, God, I pray that you would move on their heart as well. They would realize that they have sin. They have sinned against the God of of heaven and they are found guilty. But Lord, that you have made a way for them to be saved, to be reconciled back to God. That if they would only uh, repent of their sin and place their faith in Jesus Christ, they can be saved. They can be restored back to God tonight and be sons and be daughters of the Most High God. Father, thank you for uh, this group of men and women and children here tonight, Lord. I pray that, that you would honor what was done here tonight. Thank you, Lord. We love you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.